I'm Dambisa Moyo. I'm a global economist and an author. This series talks about the global markets, global economics, and geopolitics, and how it affects your world. Today, I'd like to talk about economic growth, which I would argue is the defining challenge of our time. If you look around the world today, both developed and developing countries are growing at rates far below the 7% magic number that we need to grow at in order to double per capita incomes in one generation. Put another way, we need to grow at 7% per year in order to meaningfully put a dent in poverty. If you look at emerging and developed countries today, most of them are continuing to suffer under low growth rates, primarily driven by the three key aspects that drive economic growth, which are labor, capital, and productivity. Today, we have about 7.5 billion people around the world. Countries like India are adding approximately 1 million people to the population every single month. On average, we're adding approximately 60 million people a year to the global population. According to the United Nations, we'll continue to grow until around 2100 when there'll be around 11 billion people. If we think about the population growth, this is a real opportunity on the one hand for us to garner the youth and young people and the contributions for future growth. But on the other hand, if not well managed, there'll be a real risk in a world where commodity prices and commodity becomes more scarce. It's not just the concerns around quantity that we need to think about when we think about the labor markets. We also need to think about the quality of the people. And by that, I mean how much investment are we doing in terms of the quality education that's necessary to drive economic growth. Today, the OECD has a fantastic study called the PISA study. And the statistics show that unfortunately, developed countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom and across Scandinavia that used to be in the top three are now at the bottom 30. According to McKinsey, the global consulting firm, the underinvestment in education in the United States, particularly with minority groups, is so worrisome that it could put the United States in a permanent recession. Countries such as China and Singapore that traditionally have struggled with investment in education are now at the very top. It's very important that developed countries continue to invest in quality education because they are the drivers of R&D, research and development, that will help to produce higher quality science and technology outcomes that are very necessary for not just investment in education, but also in healthcare. Income inequality has come from virtually nowhere to become one of the most important issues on the global policy agenda today. The real concern about income inequality is that the debate is complicated by four factors. First of all, there's the issue that the two leading economies, the United States and China, with two completely different political systems and two completely different economic systems, have the exact same Gini coefficient, which is the measure of income inequality, estimated at around 0.45. Now this is particularly interesting for people like myself as economists because the United States has adopted a political system which is focused on liberal democracy and it has an economic system that is focused on free market capitalism. On the other hand, China, which is the second largest economy in the world, has got state capitalism and it has deprioritized democracy as its political approach. So with these two very different systems, you have competing ideologies, and yet you have the same income inequality outcomes. If you're sitting anywhere else around the world as a policymaker, and you have to figure out which system you want to pick to combat income inequality, this becomes a real issue. What's even more worrisome is that China's income inequality has improved over the last decade, whereas that of the United States has worsened. A second issue that complicates the debate around income inequality is that, frankly, we have tried two very competing models even within the democratic framework. On the one hand, we have sought to tax and redistribute. On the other hand, we've done what many right-side conservative approaches would be, which is around supply-side economics, where we keep taxes low, and that has also not helped to reduce income inequality. So if you think about Democrats versus Republicans, these two approaches have been tried, but neither of them have reduced the income inequality spread that we see today. The world is in such a stark income inequality place that the Oxfam report that came out in January 2016 cited that the 62 wealthiest people in the world today have more wealth than the bottom 50% of people on the planet. A third aspect that complicates the income inequality debate is really about how should we think 
about income inequality. Should we care about the relative income inequality between the average worker versus, let's say, somebody like Steve Jobs, who is a multi-billionaire? Or should we care about what we would call the absolute income inequality? The idea that everybody should have a minimum standard of living, a basic level of living around the planet. One of the things that's really important in the debate around inequality is to make sure that we're not just focused on income inequality, but we should also be concerned about what the ramifications of income inequality are for political inequality, wealth inequality, but also the inequality around health and education access. And this is where the debate lands today. If you look at places like the United States, and we'll take New York as an example, the Upper East Side is one of the wealthiest enclaves in the world. However, just 20 minutes away is the Bronx, which is the poorest congressional district in the United States. And if you, people are living cheek by jowl in a society where there are people who are unable to see prospects for improving their lives and they continue to see a deterioration in their income and in their wealth, that should be a concern, not just for our neighbors, but globally as well. So income inequality can also permeate political systems. One of the statistics that comes out of the New York Times, in a country of the United States size, which is approximately 300 million people, only 158 families contribute 50% of campaign funding in the United States political system. And that is quite a damning statistic, given the US focus on democracy. So capital, how much money you have, has become a really big issue, particularly in the advent of the financial crisis of 2008. Just since 2008, we've seen $60 trillion of additional debt added, mainly because governments were trying to reduce the risk of recessions and depressions. Of course, debt is needed to some extent in order to fuel investment in education and infrastructure and healthcare. But at the same time, having too much debt acts as a drag on economic growth. Natural resource scarcity, this idea of commodities, is becoming a very big problem. The best way to think about commodity risk is to frame it as demand and supply. On the one hand, we have concerns around rising population, greater urbanization, and the fact that on average, we have been improving people's lives and incomes have been increasing. All of those three factors are increasing the amount of demand for commodities such as water, arable land, gold, copper, metals, oil and gas. And on the other hand, the supply side, that list of commodities are all scarce, finite and depleting. And so we try and balance these two aspects, the demand side and the supply side, and that creates a lot of risk in terms of prices around the world. Although many politicians tend to focus on capital and how much labor you have, most people don't spend much time talking about productivity. And yet productivity is 60% of why one country grows and another one does not. You can think of total factor productivity as a catch-all. It's everything from the rule of law and democratic process in a country, but it's also about technology and innovation and how quickly we're able to convert the talent and the capital in the country into economic growth. As you think about productivity, it's really important to think about the structure of an economy. If you look at the United States, for example, in 1900, over 60% of the American workforce was involved in agriculture. Today, it's only less than 3%. This is really important because what we've seen is a movement out of agriculture into manufacturing and from manufacturing into services to such an extent that 80% of the American workforce today works in the service sector. As we continue to think about productivity, one of the big debates is about technology and whether technology is actually contributing to what we would call a jobless workforce. In other words, is technology replacing human beings in the workplace? According to Keynes, the British economist in the 1930s, he actually forecasted that by 2030, we would have a 15 hour work week. That would mean working just three hours a day. And that would largely be because we'd have been replaced by technological advances. A recent report out of Oxford St. Martin says that 47% of jobs in the United States would be gone by 2020 because of technological advances. According to policymakers and a lot of debate in the public policy today, this is a real concern for future growth because ultimately we need to figure out how to deploy people's talents in a more productive way. According to the IMF, we do not expect to see economic growth rates that we saw pre-2007 ever again.